I'd like you to turn in your Bibles tonight to the book of Judges, chapter number 8. In Judges, chapter number 8, our focus in chapter 8 has been uh, on this very idea of maintaining the proper focus. And I want us to uh, put our focus tonight on focus on the prize. And this is the idea behind it, finishing your life well. I remember as a child growing up, I would become ambitious over certain things. Uh, in the summertime, I would get ambitious about the library reading club, and I'd start in on a book. It didn't last for long. And that ambition uh, very quickly waned. Uh, even today, I will oftentimes start many books. In fact, I'm typically reading I don't know how many books I'm reading it at the same time, but I, I'm reading a bunch at the same time. And, and uh, my wife and one of my daughters will sit down and read a book in its entirety in one sitting. I can't do that. I absolutely cannot do that. Uh, another one of my daughters is my hero. Because not only can we not read one in one sitting, we just pat ourselves on the back when we actually read the thing in its entirety. It might take us an entire year to do it, but man, we read it, and we read it in its entirety. And, and uh, I like to say, well, I, I get a whole lot more out of it. Well, I don't know whether I do or don't, but uh, I certainly end up reading my fair share of material anymore. And uh, typically, if you see me, I've got a book somewhere nearby. Uh, if it's not on my computer, it's uh, in my hand or in a driver's bag on a bus or something like that. But uh, very seldom is there a book not by. It's kind of different from the way I was growing up as a child. I also remember some ambitions of starting a, a model in some way, whether it was a car or a model truck or something like that. And, and uh, boy, I remember just being so excited into it and, and working through all the parts to the engine. And then that started getting kind of boring after a while, too. And, and uh, I had a, assembled a lot of engine blocks to model cars. Uh, how many actual models did I complete? Not nearly as many as I had started. Life is a challenge, all, no doubt. But what I want us to put our focus on tonight is how do we finish well? Uh, the remainder of Judges chapter 8 that we'll study tonight focuses on events during uh, the rest of Gideon's life. Gideon was used by God to bring about a tremendous victory against the Midianites, but unfortunately he made a decision that resulted in a snare for his own family and that of Israel. Much of his life is indeed commendable, but he compromised in other areas and brought about problems as a result of that. How do we finish strong? There are a lot of athletes who have begun a race with great passion and fervor, only to find themselves never finishing or not finishing well. Many Christians, I believe, have become sidetracked by the world only to find themselves not finishing strongly. There's a study in contrast that I would like to mention just as kind of an introduction. The Bible teaches both of these individuals in just a few verses in 2 Timothy chapter 4. The first one is a negative influence, the life of Demas. Paul said of this individual, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica. Can't help but hear a sense of heartbreak as Paul penned those words. How close were he and Demas, we do not know. But what we know of Demas is Demas left Paul because he was more allured by the things of this world. On the other hand, Paul is stated in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse number 7 where he says, I fought a good fight and I finished my course. I've kept the faith. If you are a believer here today, I would say that Paul's statement is one that you would want to be said of your own life. But the desire to want it to be said does not mean that that's what's going to be said. 
I had a lot of desires to read a lot of books or complete a lot of models, but none of those books or models were ever completed because I had a desire to complete them. They were only completed when I took certain steps to achieve that goal. There are many believers who want to be able to say at the end of their life that I fought a good fight and that I finished my course. Whatever my course is, I didn't have to run anybody else's, thankfully. Mine was perhaps difficult enough, but I hope to be able to get to the end of my life and say, you know what, I, I, I did what I needed to do. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. I, I long for that to be able to be said of my children and, and uh, those within our church that, that this is who we are and this is what characterizes us. But and if we do not maintain our focus until the end of our life, what we will find is that we may do a lot of things right, but when it comes to the end of our life, we sometimes can fail very miserably. Gideon, as we'll study in Judges chapter 8, became sidetracked with at the end of his life. When we properly focus on the prize and our eyes are kept where they need to be, I believe that we will maintain a strong focus all the way to the finish. And that's what I hope is able to be said of you and what I hope is able to be said of us as a church. We have to understand how important it is that we finish the race well. Begin in chapter number 8, verses 22 and 23, and I want us to see Gideon's refusal to be king. And what we'll do is we'll take certain points of Gideon's life and we'll discuss them and then we'll mention how those things relate to us and, and how a person who desires to finish well, how those types of principles are able to be implemented in his life using this as a basis here in Gideon uh, chapter number, or in Judges chapter 8 with the life of Gideon. Verse number 22, the Bible says, Then the men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's son also, for thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. And Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. Now, keep in mind what it is that's just taken place. They have uh, taken and, and have very soundly defeated the Midianites. They captured the two kings, Zeba and Zalmunna, and they have executed both of them. There's no doubt that emotions are riding very high. And I would say that in the enthusiasm of the moment, the people all of a sudden said, Hey, Gideon, we want you to establish a dynasty in which you are going to be the first king." I do not believe that this is all Israel, even though uh, it is stated here that the men of Israel said this. I think instead it's limited to the northern tribes, most likely the ones whom he summoned to help defeat the Midianites. I find it very difficult to perceive that Ephraim would have been part of this request to make him king since they had been so upset over his not asking them to be part of the battle. It would stand a reason, most likely, that these are from Manasseh, Asher, uh, Zebulun, and Naphtali, the northern tribes, Judges chapter 6, I believe it's verse 35, uh, spells out the tribes whom he specifically invited to partake of this. It's interesting because this is a very significant request because, to our knowledge, this is the first time that the people actually requested a king. Most likely Moses anticipated this day and provided some instruction for choosing a king back in Deuteronomy chapter number 17. I don't want us to get sidetracked by looking there. You're welcome to jot that passage down. It's verses 14 through 20. And you'll see that Moses uh, seemed to foresee the day when they would choose a king. And he gave certain requirements and wisdom as to how they should go about selecting a king. This would be the first request, however, that would eventually be uttered years later to a man by the name of Samuel, who very bitterly protested the request. God never designed Israel to be a monarch, a government that would be run by a king. He instead intended for them to be a theocracy. God, his original intent and his original design was that he be the ruler, and not man. Eventually, God did allow them to 
be able to get what it is that they believed they so eagerly wanted. I do not believe that the people's desire was to put a man in charge over them so that they could depart from God and his commands. It seems to me that the request that is made is a spontaneous request that has very little thought. They look at it and they see what it was that he had done for them. And so they say, hey, we want you to be king over us. But not only you, we we want your son to be king over us. In fact, we want your son's son to be king over us. And they didn't even know his sons or the character of his sons, much less his grandsons. But they wanted them to rule over all of them. Why? Because according to verse number 22, you delivered us from the hand of Midian. You know, we've all found ourselves caught up in the moment of various exciting things. Many fans in sporting events have done some very foolish things because they got caught up in the excitement of a particular moment. Let's introduce the first principle for finishing well. Those who finish well avoid making emotional and impulsive decisions. We cannot allow ourselves to make hasty decisions or decisions that are made perhaps in the heat of a moment. I do not know exactly what it was that transpired, but uh, I was working a concert last night along with 27 other drivers and, and at the Biltmore, and evidently somebody on one of the buses uh, got angry with I don't know a wife or girlfriend, I'm not sure, but uh, decided that it would be in his best interest to punch a window on the bus. (laughs) He broke it. (laughs) That was dumb. (laughs) Uh, That was expensive. Uh, I don't know that he went completely through it, but it at least uh, broke the window. That's uh, uh, being caught up in the moment. Not the smartest thing to do. In fact, we could really say that was quite foolish to do. Emotional decisions oftentimes lack a number of things. They often lack wisdom. We don't think through things. We just make the decision. There's a, I know some people who operate that way. I, I, it just repulses me to operate that way. Well, just make a decision even if it's the wrong one. You ever heard that? Well, why would you do that? (laughs) Why would you intentionally make the wrong decision? I can't see whether or not to pull away from this stop sign. Just make a decision, even if it's the wrong one. You see? This is not a very sound way way to, to live your life by. They often lack discernment. This decision, to me, reeks of lacking discernment. We want every way, Gideon, you delivered us from Midian, so we want you to rule over us. We want your son to rule over us. We even want your grandson to rule over us. Uh, We'll find out in chapter number 9 that uh, some of his family, that was not a very good request to make. They often lack resolve as well, emotional decisions. There's very little stick-to-itiveness with an emotional decision. Oftentimes, the decisions that are made in the heat of the moment will fade as quickly as the emotion fades. We get all excited about something, and, and, oh man, we just feel better about it. People want that in church, and I'm not certainly designed towards making you feel better. My goal is to make you more like Jesus Christ. If you feel better, that's fine. If you feel convicted, that's probably even better. It's a better approach to things, and and I think it's a better way to to take life. But people look at church and they say, oh man, I just want to be able to leave that church and I want to feel better. Well, what do you want to feel better about? You want to feel better about your sin and the lack of following Christ? Yeah, I just want to be lifted up. 
I understand there are times where we need to be encouraged, but there are better things than to simply rely on emotion. God's given us emotion, but emotion has to maintain a proper balance in our life. And when we allow ourselves to be ruled by emotion, we will make some very tragic decisions. And I can assure you, you will make some very foolish statements when you allow yourself to be governed by emotion. A person who finishes well will avoid making emotional and impulsive decisions. Gideon recognized that their desire was not a good desire and he refused it. He said, I will not rule over you. Neither shall my son rule over you. This is not a good decision, and thank God Gideon was not caught up in the emotion of the moment. Yeah, we just killed a Midianite. Woo, we got the kings. Hey, you be king. Yeah, all right, I'll be king. Thankfully, he was guided by something much better. For them to make him king, or even his son's king, would be wrong. He says, the Lord shall rule over you. Gideon didn't allow the pomp and the prestige of being a king to lure him into a wrong decision. Because if he did, he would have defied the essence of what God created and what God intended. Gideon determined he would do right, regardless of what the public wanted him to do. And I find for this, Gideon should be commended. But unfortunately, we go to another section. And that is the snare of the ephod in verses 23 through 27. Or verses 24, really, through 27. Admittedly, there are lots of questions about this particular passage. In fact, I'll say this now. Many questions remain about this passage, but the facts can't be ignored. Um, there are a lot of questions that are unable to be resolved due to the silence of Scripture. Uh, why did he seek this ephod? What, what was his reasoning behind it? What was his motive behind it? Well, we really don't know that. We're not told the amount of time that elapsed after he collects the gold until the time that he created the ephod. What the ephod actually was made of is never stated. Some speculate that it was a golden ephod that was placed as an object in the city of Ophrah. We don't Oh, did Gideon actually engage in worshiping this, or did only others? And it became a snare, we know, to both him as well as his house, as the passage is going to teach. Does that mean that Gideon literally fell down and worshiped this, or does it mean that Gideon's decision resulted in this? Again, I don't know. We can't get sidetracked by speculation but we do need to pay attention to what it is that God has for us. What are the facts and, and what is it that we're able to discern? And the speculation uh, has to just simply be left at that. The first thing we see is that Gideon did request a significant reward. The Bible says in verse 24, Gideon said unto them, I would desire a request of you that ye would give me every man the earrings of his prey. For they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. He wanted a portion of the spoil from the victory with the Midianites. Whether or not he had already determined to make an ephod is never stated. It may actually be that he just simply wanted a reward. He already stated in Judges chapter 6 and verse 15, My family is poor in Manasseh. Maybe that he was tired of living the life of poverty and it was about time that he be rewarded for his work. Regardless of the reason as to why he requested it, he made this request that each person give him their golden earrings. The Bible at the end of verse number 24 says that they were Ishmaelites. They were actually Israelites. The term is a generic term describing nomadic tribes who were involved in trade. It's what the Ishmaelites were known for, and many of the tribes in northern Israel were nomadic and were known for trading as well. That's why their term, uh, the term is given to them. 
Well, the people had no problem with giving him the reward, verse number 25, and they answered, we will willingly give them. And they spread out a garment and did cast therein every man the earrings of his prey. And the weight of the golden earrings that he requested was a thousand and seven hundred shekels of gold, beside ornaments and collars and purple raiment that was on the kings of Midian and beside the chains that were about their camels' necks. He was the one who had led them victoriously against the Midianites. It was very fitting that we go ahead and reward him. And so they took a garment and spread it out on the ground. And each person came by and cast the earrings of the Midianites, the prey, cast them onto this particular garment. And in doing so, the Bible teaches us he amassed quite a fortune. By the time it was all said and done, they weighed this to be 1,700 shekels, depending on the scale, that would be between 40 and 50 pounds of gold. I've seen as high as 75. Most scholars are 40 to 50. I can just tell you with a house full of ladies, that's a lot of earrings. Okay, that's a lot of jewelry, and that's what they threw down. But in addition to this, the Bible also says in verse number 26 that he collected ornaments. These would be uh, ornaments and collars. These would be uh, pendants, crescent-shaped pendants that they would end up wearing around their necks. They gave Gideon the purple raiment, the royal clothing that uh, dressed the kings of Midian. In addition to that, they gave him the gold chains that hung off the necks of the camels. How much total was this value? We have no idea. But it's definitely fair to say that Gideon amassed quite a bit of a fortune. What I don't know is, had he already determined to make an ephod out of this? Or did the idea come to him after he had already amassed the fortune. It's quite possible that he requested this reward and as he sat there pondering what it was that he could do with all of this newfound wealth, he decided to make the ephod. I do not know. If that's the case, we would say that Gideon failed the test of prosperity. It certainly is at least a possibility, but I cannot say it dogmatically. I don't know the motive and I don't know the timeline, but I do know, secondly, that Gideon made an ephod. What is an ephod? The ephod was a portion of the priestly garment that extended from the shoulder down to the waist and it would be tied on the sides. It would have uh, gold rings and so forth and everything would end up being tied and associated with the ephod were the two stones, the Urim and the Thummim, two black stones, each of which contained the uh, six names of the tribes of Israel. You may recall these two stones were used by the priest to discern the Lord's will. In my opinion, and again, I have to say it's opinion, Gideon did not form the ephod for him to worship. I think that's contradictory to his character. It is certainly possible. But I believe that his intent was to be able to discern the Lord's will and lead the nation properly. It's quite possible to regard the priesthood of his day as being absolutely corrupt and pagan, most likely even the leaders of the idolatry. It seems to me to fit with Gideon's character that perhaps he feared he would no longer have the direct revelations from God and would need to know how to lead the people and how to discern the Lord's will. It may seem as though it is a justification, but we have to be reminded that God's design was for the high priest to wear the linen ephod. God's requirements for the high priest was that he descended from Aaron. He was from the tribe of Manasseh. He certainly didn't descend from Aaron, nor was he even a Levite. You see, Gideon was not qualified to be high priest, certainly should not have been wearing much less creating an ephod. That's going to lead us to a principle that I'll deal with here in just a moment, but I also need you to understand that his decision adversely affected 
Israel. The Bible says that Gideon made an ephod thereof and put it in his city, even in Ophrah. And all Israel went thither a whoring, a whoring after it, which thing became a snare unto Gideon and to his house. Let me come back to... Well, let me not come back to this. Look at how it affected Gideon adversely. What, what was this makeup of this ephod? I'll get to the principles here in just a minute. The makeup of it is in question. There's nothing in the text that says this was a solid gold ephod that was erected as a statue. It's possible that it was, but it's also possible that it wasn't. To me, it was most likely a linen ephod, much like the priest wore. So then why did he need so much gold? Well, many have assumed that since he accumulated so much gold that he had to have fashioned a golden ephod. There's nothing in the text that indicates that. It's quite possible that he used the gold for not only the various components of the ephod, but also to be able to pay someone to make it. <laughs> we just simply do not know. Was the ephod hung in places? There are those who say there's no record of an ephod ever being hung or put into a specific place. Well, I beg to differ when you read in 1 Samuel chapter 21, Gideon, I'm sorry, Goliath's sword was placed in wrapped in a, a cloth lying in front of an ephod that was apparently hung. And so it would be all right to assume that it was still a linen ephod. Why, again, I don't know, but it's my opinion Gideon did this to be able to personally discern the Lord's will. I find it very difficult to believe that he would intentionally lead them back into idolatry, realizing what it was that ended up taking place. Regardless of his intent, however, it still created problems for Israel. The consequences of his decision were nonetheless very real. Verse 27 says that all Israel went a whoring after it. In other words, here they literally prostituted themselves by committing spiritual fornication. It's a frequent comparison in the Word of God to describe idolatry. And they began worshiping this ephod. But it also began to affect not only Gideon, but also his own home. The word snare in verse number 27, it became a snare unto Gideon and to his house suggests that it became something which trapped both he and his family. What a tragic end for a man who did so much. That leads us to two principles that I want to discuss. Those who finish well not only avoid making emotional, impulsive decisions, but also never justify the means by examining the end. It's a pragmatic approach to life that says, I know that my actions are wrong, but as long as what I'm doing ends up being good, it's okay. It would reason along these lines. My family is hungry. My responsibility is to feed them. I'll go ahead and steal to feed them. Stealing, even though it has the noble end of feeding my family, is wrong. Feeding my family does not justify or does not make stealing right. Even if Gideon, and I have to say if because it's so much speculation, did Gideon do this to discern the Lord's will? That's my opinion because of the connection with the Urim and the Thummim. I may be wrong on that. But let's say for a moment that that is why Gideon did so. If Gideon designed this, in order to discern the Lord's will, does it justify his actions? It does not. 
He was not a descendant of Aaron, nor was he of the tribe of Levi. Levi. He therefore had no right to be attired in priestly garments, even if the priesthood was corrupt. You see, the end never justifies the means. If you want to finish your race well, you want to finish your life well, you're going to have to avoid making emotional and impulsive decisions. And you're also never going to be able to justify the means by examining the end. You must always do what is right and trust God with the end. God could very easily have still directed him and still revealed his will as clearly as he did before he went to the Midianites. It is never right to do wrong. Never. And we live in a society today that adamantly disagrees with what I'm saying right now. To our society today, it's okay to lie. Well, no, it's not. Why? Because God said it's not. Now, if God's not the authority of your life, good luck defining right and wrong. <laughs> uh, that's a pretty big deal. If um, God's not the authority of your life, then, then who decides what's right and what's wrong? Your children? Uh, they may want to, but that's not going to work. Even I don't, I'm not the final authority of what's right and wrong. God is. And if what I feel is right, God says is wrong, then I need to stop thinking it's right and readjust my thinking and say, all right, God, doesn't matter what I feel. It doesn't matter that I don't think there's anything wrong with. The issue isn't you. <laughs> I, it gripes me to no end. Somebody comes and says, well, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I don't care. I know this sounds terrible, but I don't care what you think. Why? Because the issue isn't whether or not you think it's wrong. The issue is whether or not God says it's wrong. And if God says it's wrong, it doesn't matter what I think. I need to adjust my thinking to be in line with what God says. And if God says something is right, then by all means, it's fine. But if God teaches something is wrong, it doesn't matter what your opinion of that issue is. It is wrong. A person who finishes well has to, and we could phrase this a little bit differently if we wanted to, and the essence would still be the same, has to be committed to doing what is right at all times. Number three, those who finish well recognize that decisions have consequences. A decision with no consequences simply does not exist. Now, decisions may have varying degrees of consequences and may even have delayed consequences, but they will always have consequences, always. Good decisions have good consequences. We call them blessings or results. <laughs> bad decisions have bad consequences. The consequences of Gideon's decision were very negative and affected Israel as well as himself and those within his own family. So when you recognize that your decisions have consequences, then we find ourselves certain to make sound decisions. Time will only allow me to mention just an additional principle when it comes to making decisions. When you recognize that the decisions have consequences, you have to avoid decisions that adversely affect other people. Um, and this is the essence of Christian liberty that looks at the spiritual well-being of others and determines whether or not to engage in certain behavior that the Bible neither condemns as wrong nor affirms as right. Um, how does my decision affect others? So as a husband and as a dad, my decisions affect those within my own family. What I allow in moderation, my children will do in extreme. So I better make some good decisions. I only wish that what I prayed in moderation, my children would pray in extreme. 
It doesn't ever seem to work that way. It certainly seems to take the negative side, however, and, and uh, often go the wrong way. We cannot, uh, we cannot allow ourselves to, to function that way. Maybe you um, have siblings. Uh, doesn't mean they have to be living in the home. They may be living outside the home. But how many siblings have justified behavior because another sibling is doing it? You see? This is the very same principle. So if your decision adversely affects so-and-so, you need to rethink your decision because your decision is to the spiritual detriment of somebody else. And so even if we come back to the infamous I don't think it's wrong statement, if it's adversely affecting others, it's wrong. Okay? Rest assured. Let's move on to the death of Gideon, verse number 28. Thus was Midian subdued before the children of Israel, so that they lifted up their heads no more. The country was in quietness 40 years in the days of Gideon. Uh, quite interesting that Israel enjoyed a period of rest for now 40 years during Gideon's reign, during his tenure. But Gideon, verse 29, Jerobel, the son of Joash, went and dwelt in his own house. This would be in the village of Ophrah. Gideon had threescore and ten sons of his body begotten, for he had many wives. Seventy boys. My mom thought she had it rough with four. <laughs> Seventy boys, but what I want you to see is the problem that he had many wives. Verse number 31, his concubine that was in Shechem, she also bare him a son whose name he called Abimelech. That sets the stage for chapter 9 because Abimelech is going to basically attempt to usurp his authority and it's going to create quite a problem. Gideon's decision to have many wives once again, is going to adversely affect Israel and will set the stage for chapter number 9. We're then told in verse number 32 that Gideon, the son of Joash, died in a good old age and was buried in the sepulcher of Joash's father in Ophrah of the Abiezrites. Um, you know, Eventually, Gideon died. And we don't know how old he was when he died, but eventually he died. And he was raised by God to be a strong deliverer. He is a man commended by faith, but he had a limited lifespan. I'll share more of that here in a moment. And it came to pass, in verse 33, as soon as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel turned again and went a-whoring after Balaam and made baal Bareth their god. Balaam is the plural of Baal. baal Bareth means Lord of the Covenant. It seems as though they entered now into a covenant with Baal as soon as Gideon died. Leads us into the rebellion of Israel. And I want you to notice the statement in verse number 4. The children of Israel remembered not the Lord their God who had delivered them out of the hand of all their enemies on every side. As I was studying through this, this thought came to my mind. God became a person relegated to the past. Oh, thank you God for doing that. You know, God's not limited by time. And he certainly is not to be relegated to the past. He is instead, however, to be very much alive and very much within the present. The passage, the Word of God reminds us in Psalm 103, the tendency that we have to forget things. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Psalm 103, verse number 2. Moses expressed a concern in Deuteronomy chapter number 6 that God, that when they entered into the prosperity of the land of Canaan, that they would forget the Lord. 
Can I encourage you never forget where God's brought you from and those things that God has done in your life? Because the moment that you forget those things, you will return to them. Unfortunately, they didn't remember what Gideon did either. Neither showed they kindness to the house of Jeroboam, namely Gideon, according to all the goodness which he had showed unto Israel. They didn't show kindness to his house after he died in spite of all that he had done for them. Israel once again became consumed with self and cared nothing for God. Let me make two more points for those who finish well. They avoid making emotional, impulsive decisions. They never justify the means by examining the end. They recognize that decisions have consequences. Number four, they understand that time is limited. Uh, you have no idea how long you're going to live. You may not make it past tonight. Most of us anticipate a certain age. The reality is it could all change very quickly. Those who finish well understand their time is limited. And number five, those who finish well never forget what God's done. It's a very dangerous thing to fail to recall all of the many blessings, the places from which God's brought you. The moment you do, you're going to have the tendency to return back to those things. Those of you who are saved at a later age, don't ever forget the place from which God delivered you. Those of you who got your life straightened out later on in your life, don't forget the place from which God delivered you. We don't want to go back there. Young people, don't go down those same paths. The older ones have gone down and have testified against the dangers of them. I don't know about you, but I sure hope that when I die, Matthew chapter 25 and verse 21, that I'm able to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I'll make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. I hope and pray that I finish well. I hope and pray the same for my children. And I hope and pray the same for those that I have opportunity to minister to. Let's finish the race that God's called us into. And let's finish the race well. Let's get to the end of our life and not look back at it with a bunch of regrets. Let's get to the end of our life and look back at it as Paul was able to and say, I finished my course. And by God's grace, I hope that's what we strive to do. Lord, thank you so much for this.